Thanks. I'm uh, honored to be here today in front of uh, everybody who's actually doing all the work. Um, and for me, um, I just want you to understand that I realize that I'm the only thing between you and lunch. Um, so I, I promise try, uh, to try to not uh, go over uh, too much. Um, I have a quick question for you. How many of you uh, are corporate developers in uh, existing large corporations? Um, and how many of you are uh, in startups or early stage ventures? OK, good. Um, so um, while the title of the talk officially is how to build a great company step by step, I thought I'd offer you, at least for those of you um, in, in startups and early stage ventures, something a little more depressing. Uh, and, and that's how to fail less. Because if most of you knew the odds of startups, we'd probably be getting a day job. But the exciting thing about you and developers is that you see something and you know something others don't. And that startups are the act of creation. And you are all going to bring something to market that never existed before. And so what I want to do today is give you some tips and advice about what we now know in the last 10 years on how to fail less and succeed more in startups. Now, when I do these talks, I, I typically find that you know it's blah, 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 and blah, 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 and sometimes you kind of hear one or two words. And you know, I think maybe the words you'll hear you know, today are funding, fail, customers, and some of this just might sound like blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the talk really is, particularly for those of you in early stage ventures, is how to get funding and fail less by talking to customers. And I, I just uh, thought I'd start with kind of, uh, as I was thinking about this, my model for, you know, somewhat tongue in cheek of how funding kind of works for developers. You know, the first question is, did you ever make uh, any of the venture capitalists or angels you're talking to money? And if the answer is no, the next question is, are you famous? And, and if so, then maybe you'll get a meeting with a partner. And if not, uh, were you referred by someone uh, they know? And if yes, you'll get a meeting with a partner or an associate. And if no, maybe the next question to ask is, have you found product market fit? And if the answer is still no, then what you really need to do is get out of the building and start talking to customers and users to see if you're building something people want and care about. Now, if you did make VCs money in some previous life, um, and the first question to ask is your new company in the same space? And if the answer is yes, you'll get a meeting with a partner, and hopefully they'll be excited, and you'll get funded. And if the answer is no, the next question is, well, in any case, did you make them a lot of money? And if the answer is yes, you'll still get um, a meeting with a partner and an associate. But if the answer is no, we go back to, do you have product market fit? And if the answer is yes, you meet with an associate, and no, you need to get out of the building. And so the question is, what is this get out of the building stuff? And why should I care as a developer? And that's kind of what I want to talk about today. What's customer development? What's business model design? And why, as a developer, should this be important to me? Well, in the last couple of years, we've now learned a lot. We know a bunch about strategy on how to build successful companies we never knew before. And the key thing we now know is that startups are not smaller versions of large companies. And the distinction is the difference between search and execution. And this is true for new ventures inside of existing companies as well. We now know that startups search and companies execute. We also know that new ventures, startups or new ventures inside of existing companies, fail almost always from a lack of customers, not a failure of your technology. This is a big idea. We have lots of processes 
to manage product development. We have lots of processes to manage code. But we have almost no processes to manage how we learn from customers. And for years, we also never had a definition of even what a new venture is, what a startup is. Startup as a set of developers in a garage or a startup inside an existing company. And so one of the things I decided to do is maybe offer a definition that's actionable for all of you on what a startup is. Because I used to think a startup's about writing code, or a startup's may maybe doing hardware, or um, gee, if I'm kind of sales and marketing oriented, maybe a startup is getting customers and orders, or revenue, or users. I'm going to give you a very different definition. For me, a startup is a temporary organization designed to search for something that's repeatable and scalable and what you're searching for is a business model. Let me repeat this again. A startup is a temporary organization. That means, in your case, there is no such thing as a 10-year-old startup. There is a 2-year-old startup that might be attached to an 8-year-old failure. A startup is a temporary organization, and you're searching for something. You're not coding, though you are. You're not selling, though you are. You're actually searching for something repeatable and scalable. And repeatable means that what you do on Monday works on Wednesday. Scalable means for every dollar of input, I have n dollars of output. But the real interesting question is, this all tends to point to a business model. What the heck is a business model? And this is key to what we now know about building successful companies. A startup aims to become a company, not stay as a startup. And so the question is, what's a business model? Now, for the last two decades, people have bandied that word about. And in fact, if you ask three academics about the definition of a business model, it used to be you'd get eight definitions. But about three years ago, someone named Alexander Osterwalder wrote a book called Business Model Generation. And he put together a definition that I think is actionable and important for all of you to understand. Anybody uh, read or ever seen uh, Osterwalder's book? Some of you. Um, if I were you, I'd download a copy. It's on the web, but I'll describe some of it. Osterwalder said, look, instead of talking about what a startup is about sales or marketing or products, let's talk about it on how the company creates value for itself while delivering products and services for customers. That is, instead of talking about your product or your organization, let's talk about all the pieces you need to build a successful company. And Osterwalder said, look, there are nine of these things. Number one, there's the value proposition. Value proposition is a fancy name for what product or service are you delivering, and what pain or gain does it solve for a co uh, company? Customer segments, who are you selling to? Channels, customer relationships, revenue streams, key resources, key partners, key activities, and key costs. And these are the activities you need to be thinking about while you just think all you need to do is build the product. This is how you build a company, is thinking about the entire business model. So let me just look at some of them in detail. The value proposition is not just about the product you're building and its features. It's about what problem or need that you're satisfying for a customer. And that's a big idea, because in my career as an entrepreneur, man, it was about how my features are better than someone else. And the next thing is, Customer segments. Your customers don't exist to buy from you. You think they do, but you actually exist for them. And that's just hard sometimes to understand. You need to understand in detail who they are, why would they buy, and understand their archetype, their geographic, 
their social characteristics, their demographics, you need to have a great understanding of not only the value proposition, and the, but the customer segment as well. This connection between value prop and customer segment, these two parts of the business model is what's called product market fit. If anybody have heard the phrase before, product market fit? Product market fit is the connection between what you're building and who you're selling to. And who is the customer and what problem are you solving for them? Those are the two most important things as developers you need to be thinking about on day one in your business model. The next probably most important thing is customer relationships, which is a fancy term for how do you get customers, how do you keep them, and how do you grow them? And I tend to think of this get, keep, and grow as kind of a double-sided funnel. You get customers in one side through customer acquisition and customer activation. You keep them by reducing churn and attrition with some loyalty programs. And then eventually, you grow them with other marketing activities, like upsell, cross-sell, next sell, et cetera. But on day one, most developers, most new projects, are focused on the left-hand side of that funnel. How do I acquire and how do I activate customers? And how do I do it inexpensively? You need to be thinking continually about this part of the business model. The other piece that I tend to worry about early is the revenue model. How does your company make money from each one of the customer segments? And what value is the customer actually paying you for? Now, what's really interesting is I used to confuse pricing tactics with revenue strategy. So a revenue strategy might be, I have a freemium model, or I have a subscription model, or I have a direct sales model. A pricing tactic is, what price am I going to set for the product? Is it free? Is it $9.99? Is it $7 a month, et cetera? Separating out revenue model from pricing tactics is a great technique for developers to think about. The other thing that kind of gets interesting is once you start thinking about the business model is you might have multiple customer segments. Each customer segment requires its own value proposition, its own revenue model, and potentially its own channel and customer relationships. That is, each one might require a different revenue model, product, and distribution channel. Best example is Google and search. We all use Google. We don't pay anything for it. We're users. The way we use Google is we just go to the web. But there's an entirely different customer segment for Google, which are payers. And they pay per click. And the product they see is completely different from us. So I want you to think about, when you're thinking about business models, whether you have multiple customer segments and what they require in each part of the business model canvas. Now, one of the nice things is this business model canvas is a great way for all of you of, as developers, whether you're a two-person company or a 200-person group in a large corporation, is to start thinking about how your company is going to create and deliver value. And it's wonderful because you could download this business model canvas for free from the web. You could post it on your wall in a conference room and start talking about value proposition and customer segments and revenue. And it's really exciting, because then you have a planning meeting and a strategy meeting. But one of the things we discovered is at the end of the day, the business model canvas is just a set of hypotheses. And by the way, I use the word hypotheses when I teach at Stanford because my students pay $50,000 a year. But outside of Stanford, the word hypotheses really means guesses. And so basically, 
When you first put together a business model canvas, all you have is a series of guesses that are untested. And I just have to digress in a second, because regardless of whether you use the business model canvas or a business plan or anything else, a new venture on day one is a faith-based initiative. All of you on day one are in a religious activity. A startup is based on its founder's vision on day one. Your job to be successful is to turn that vision, that faith, into facts as quickly as you can. I want to say that again. It's your vision, your passion, your instinct is what makes you create something out of nothing. But for this to be a sustainable and valuable business, the company needs to get past your faith into facts. Using the business model canvas to kind of articulate all your beliefs on day one is a useful exercise, but here's where the rubber meets the road. It's the question is, how do we test and search for the truth behind your hypotheses? How do we change these guesses into facts? And here's how we do it. It's something called the customer development process. Customer development is how you search for the truth behind the business model canvas. The first step is you literally leave the confines of your building, your company, your office. You take those hypotheses, you design experiments, you run tests, you get data, but it's not just the data you're interested in, it's the insight. And what sometimes happens is well, you'll start with one series of hypotheses and you get results completely in another place. You think that your customers will be X, they'll be happy to pay Y, and all of a sudden you find that something different. This is in fact why we run experiments on the business model. And in fact, it leads us to two interesting conclusions. One is we want to develop our product a piece at a time. Because in the old days, what we used to do is spec the entire product. We'd do a market requirements document. Engineering would develop an entire feature set. And then we'd lock everybody up and go into waterfall development with very little input from customers. And product management would go through spec, development, design, testing, and delivery. Sometimes this worked, but most of the time we were making two major assumptions. We were assuming that we understood the customer problem on day one. And if we understood it well enough on day one because we believed we knew, therefore we could articulate and spec the entire set of features. We now know that's just simply, in most cases, not possible at all because what the customers end up getting is something they say, well, you know, this is nice, but really what I like out of here is feature 5, 14, and 27, and the rest of what you delivered to me is not something I really cared about. And so now with agile development, we could deliver products iteratively and incrementally, but the key idea is we're getting out of the building and testing our hypotheses of not only the product, but about the customer, about the channel, about the value proposition, about customer relationships, and we're trying to make sure we understand customers' wants and needs top to bottom. The other key thing is something called the pivot. Uh, years ago, when I first started talking about customer development, I drew a little arrow between customer validation and discovery. And Eric Reese, best student I ever had in my class, I sat on his board, and the first practitioner of customer development gave a name to that arrow. He called it the pivot. And the pivot is what happens when hypotheses don't match reality. And this is a huge concept. 
Because in the old days, when hypotheses didn't match reality, we fired you. We fired you. Or if we didn't fire you as the founder, the first person we fired was the VP of sales. Why? Because we'd say, you know what? You guys didn't make the plan. Where did the plan come from? Well, we had a series of hypotheses that we would actually make this amount of revenue in this amount of time. And it turns out, most of the time, most of the time, startups go from failure to failure. It's a big idea. Startups go from failure to failure. Only in the movies does it go from success to success. And so your job is to learn from not only what goes right, but what goes wrong. And if we build a process to integrate failure into the system, instead of firing executives for not making the plan, we consider that learning. And that's one of the biggest parts of the customer development process, is getting out of the building. And when we find that something doesn't match reality, we change the business model canvas. A substantive change is a pivot. A minor change is what we call an iteration. The customer development process, pretty simple. Four steps, customer discovery, customer validation, uh, customer creation, company building. Phase one of customer discovery is you state your hypotheses. You draw the business model canvas inside the building. And then you leave your building, physically or virtually, and you test the problem. Not the product, but you test your key assumptions about what the customer problem is. And then when you're sure you understand the customer problem, you get to test your solution in front of those customers. And most of the time, you don't quite have that right. And so that's why this is a loop. You either verify, ultimately, that you're correct, or more than likely, you're going to pivot back to the beginning. You modify your canvas. You test your key assumptions again. You get out of the building. You test the solution again. And you iterate, not just through the problem and solution, but multiple times through the channel, through your assumptions about pricing, through your assumptions about how you're going to do customer acquisition and activation. And this is a continual cycle. We teach this in my classes. We teach this also online. And within a week, we have potential startups, or actual startups, talking to over 100 customers face to face within a week. I have to tell you, that data is sobering. Even though you might be the most passionate founder in the world, getting real customer feedback on your UI, on your application, on your assumptions about pricing, is just absolutely invaluable. And the next step in the customer development process is customer validation. And you do customer validation after you think you understand the customer problem. And you actually really think they like your solution. You get ready to sell. And then you get out of the building again. And this time, you're actually trying to get orders or to get users. You take that data. You develop the positioning for your company, both corporate and product. And then you verify, and again, you pivot and proceed. This is a continual process, and it's hard. It's really hard, because if you're a great developer, the odds are you'll go, you know what? I know all this stuff. I just want to sit here and code. I want to add some more features. Gee, look, I can make the phone ring, and I can make it ring somewhere else, and I could do one. It's just really hard to find people who might disagree with you. One of the hardest things for a great founder is to be able to integrate data that creates cognitive dissonance. So uh, let me just uh, 
take the last couple minutes and tell you a story of uh, a developer, actually a, a founder in the beginning of the last century, who was probably one of the greatest founders you've never heard of. And um, explain to uh, you something which might happen to you um, if you're both lucky and unlucky at the same time. Um, anybody ever know who the inventor of the modern corporation is? Any MBAs in the room? Anybody know who this guy is? I don't know if you can see the picture. It's uh, on Time Magazine in the 1920s. This guy was uh, Alfred P. Sloan. Anybody um, know who Sloan was? Anybody ever uh, hear his name? Famous guy from Detroit. Who was he? Yeah, the people think of him as the founder of General Motors. In the 1950s, Sloan was the combination of Zuckerberg, you know, Eric Schmidt, and Bill Gates, and everybody rolled into one. General Motors was the largest corporation in the U.S. This guy was it. He was the president and chairman of GM. He invented some of the basics of what we think today of the modern large corporation. Distributed cost accounting, divisionalization, annual change, uh, model changes, tiered pricing. Guy was a genius. And when he retired, lots of things got named after him. MIT Sloan School, the Sloan Foundation, the Sloan Kettering Cancer Institute. Anybody know who Kettering was? Well, of course, the VP of Engineering at GM. Uh, this guy was absolutely famous. He grew GM uh, to be the dominant company, it's hard to believe now, uh, in the 20th century. In the US, you thought of Sloan as the man for companies. Well, what's really interesting is in the 20th century, we celebrated CEOs of major corporations. We didn't think much about founders, about the developers. The real surprise is most of you don't recognize this guy. Now, if you look at a picture of this guy, you know, you could have seen him on the streets of Palo Alto last night or in the Mission District. I mean, he looks kind of like, you know, one of us. His name was Billy Durant. Anybody know who Billy Durant was? I'd be surprised. Turns out, Billy Durant was the real founder of General Motors. Sloan was just the president and chairman later. Durant has a great story. Durant made horse-drawn buggy carriages in the 1890s, right? Imagine the carts that went uh, behind horses. Durant, one day, was sitting in Flint, Michigan at the bar with his fellow horse cart manufacturers. And one day, at the bar, he hears these explosions coming down the road. Dirt road, Flint, Michigan, small town, and the horses are running wild, and what is this thing? And his fellow drinking mates are laughing hysterically because they're lurching down the road as the first horse-drawn carriage, uh, 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 sorry, uh, horseless carriage ever seen. It was the first automobile in Flint, Michigan. And his other cart manufacturer friends, all drinking, were laughing. This was the funniest thing they had ever seen until they turned around and Billy Durant was gone, gone. This was a Friday. By next Monday, Billy Durant had sold his entire horse cart manufacturing business and started investing in the hottest technology of his time, automobiles. And by the beginning of the 20th century, he had assembled some of the best technical developers he could find in different brands and assembled them under one umbrella and called it General Motors. Billy Durant founded General Motors. He grew the company until he brought in investors and bankers. And because he was a crazy founder, just kept doing new things and one, his bankers fired him, fired the founder. Depressing story. What did Durant do? He said, screw you guys. I'm going to start another car company. And he found another developer, a guy named Louis Chevrolet. And he grew Chevrolet 
into a bigger car company than General Motors. It was so big, he took Chevrolet public, bought up all the GM stock, and fired the board that fired him. Does that kind of feel good? Okay. He regains control of General Motors, runs it for another 10 years, until he's yet again fired by the board for the second time. This time, his startup is the equivalent of $3.6 billion in today's money. So what happened? How come we've never heard of Durant? So Durant versus Sloan. Sloan dies rich, honored, and famous. Durant? Durant dies managing a bowling alley penniless in 1947. This was the accountant. Warning for you, you are here. So thank you very much. <laughs>